Welcome to online worship at Frederick Nazarene. We pray today that you would be blessed and find encouragement and inspiration in the Word of God, the Bible, and as you lift your heart to the Lord in song. As we begin, we would like to present a new opportunity for you to help people worldwide who are in days of crisis. As we continue, we ask that you take time to seek God and to ask how you might participate in this life-changing ministry. God bless you today as you worship Him. Woke up this morning and I saw a world full of trouble now. How do we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turn my eyes to heaven. Say, God, why don't you do this? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your goodness, your blessing, your kindness to us. And I thank you that Jesus suffered and died that we might know right relationship with you. And I thank you that part of that right relationship is to seek you, but also to, to bless others and to be a blessing to those around us. So find us faithful to tune our hearts to your grace today and to find ways to allow your spirit to speak to us about ways that we can be a blessing to others. I pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's worship together. Child of God. 
Verses 1 and 2, 97, and 102 to 112. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. Oh, how I love your law! I meditate on it all day long. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. The word of the Lord.
In Thurmont, there's an old farm, beautiful stone farmhouse called Father's Farewell. And it has really been in disrepair for a couple years now. But in recent days, they've start ref started refurbishing the eastern pastures there on Moser Road. And so they've put up new fences and uh, they have some farm animals out in the yard, two big workhorses and a bunch of goats and one sheep, <laughs> just one sheep. It's always interesting to me when there's uh, one type of an animal among a bunch of others and the sheep's bigger than almost all of the goats, but there it is all alone. And I, I'm just always fascinated by farm animals on the way uh, down to Frederick from our home in Thurmont right at Fish Hatchery Road, there's a little hobby farm and they've had, um, uh, they've had alpacas and uh, the little uh, pigs and uh, they have a lot of goats and they have some turkeys and some geese. And it's always fascinating to drive by there and see what's going to be out in the yard. And just recently there was this little bitty newborn goat uh, with its mother. It's always wonderful to see God's creation. And, and, um, but, but today's scripture is about uh, sheep. It's about us being like sheep and going astray. And I just wanna highlight the fact that, that even in the middle of this Lenten season, when uh, we're, we're looking at more sobering uh, truths about uh, God's word, about the Bible, that we need to keep in mind continually the redemptive purposes of God and the fact that he doesn't give up on us. We might be like sheep who've gone astray, but he does not give up on us. And so today, as we open God's word, we continue in this series about the suffering Messiah. And today uh, our focus will be the suffering of sin. Last week, we focused on the the suffering of isolation. And today, the, the suffering of sin, and we're in Isaiah 53 again, and we'll focus specifically on verse six. And so I encourage you to take the word in hand, take your Bible in hand and open it up to the, the passage of scripture and take time to allow the passage to speak to you as I preach and hear the word of the Lord for today. I wanna begin with reading five different versions or paraphrases of this particular verse. And so follow along as I read, first of all, from the New King James Version. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The voice is a modern day paraphrase. And so it speaks maybe a little more clearer to our generation. We all have wandered off like sheepless, like shepherdless sheep, scattered by our aimless striving and endless pursuits. The eternal one, this is the term that the voice uses for God Almighty, God the Father, the eternal one laid on him, on Jesus, the silent sufferer, the sins of us all. From the Holman Christian Standard, we all went astray like sheep, we all have turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The Amplified, I love the Amplified, it, it spells things out for us. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all. And then in parentheses, it says our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing to fall on him in parentheses, instead of us. And finally, the New Living Translation. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. This is the word of the Lord for us today. The fact that the good news of the Christian message is for everyone is emphasized by the fact that this verse begins with the word all and concludes with the word all. It can only mean 
that all people are under sin and the wrath of sin, but also that divine mercy has been extended to all. Now think about this. You and I, under the wrath of sin without Jesus in our lives, but because of Christ's sacrifice, God's mercy is extended to all. None are excluded. All have sinned, all can be saved. It's a beautiful story. We see as we open God's word here today that God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. This is Romans chapter 11, verse 32. God has committed us over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on us all. That doesn't mean that God made us disobey. It means that God uh, allows us to disobey. He gives us free will. He doesn't pull us back from disobeying. But, but even though we have all disobeyed, his mercy is extended to all. You see, the, the fact that the good news of the Christian message is for everyone is emphasized in these verses. Salvation, like the Bible, is addressed to all and is available to all. No exclusions. And so this includes you and it includes me. Whatever this verse says is said to you. The, the verse tells us what Jesus did for you and for me when he died on the cross. He took our sin and the punishment for that sin, he took it on himself. So think with me first of all about the sufferings caused by sin. The scripture says he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Wounded for our transgressions, and bruised for our iniquities. The way of the transgressor, the way of the sinner is hard. It's a difficult way. It's a harsh way. And the scripture describes sin as going astray or turning everyone to his own way. The comparison is between people and sheep. Sheep are helpless and they're, they're lovable but they are also prone to wander, right? They're prone to wander. The figure of the sheep is as symbolic of people is used often in the Bible. It's used often in the Old Testament. It's used often in the New Testament. Jesus used it frequently. This figure of, of sheep as symbolic of people is used often in the Bible. A dog or a horse will very rarely wander off or become lost, but a sheep, on the other hand, needs perennial supervision. When New Testament scripture tells us that there is no one righteous, no not one, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it is simply telling us, in other words, what Isaiah said when he stated that all we like sheep have gone astray. This, this, this um, focus, this theme, it's throughout the New Testament as well. Sin may be pleasurable. It may be gratifying for a while, for a time, for a season, but it turns out to be laborious. It is difficult, it, it is stressful. Sin is tiring work and it's full of heartache. Sin will break your heart. Sin always comes back to us. It comes back on us. The sins of Jacob's youth, return to plague him in his old age. The sins of Samson found him a prisoner and grinding grain, having been blinded by his enemies. The sin sins of King David brought judgment on his house and Absalom, his son, died an untimely death at a very young age. Sin returned on all of these men. Sin turned on all of these men, all of them who had accomplished great things for God, all of them who were children of God. Sin also brings pain, a deep pain. And, and the reality is that almost all of us, almost all of the families of our church have been touched by this deep pain that is brought on by sin. As we look at God's word, we see that there 
are countless devastating and heartbreaking illustrations of the effects of sin. And as we look around us, we see that there are countless devastating and heartbreaking illustrations of sin. 17-year-old Kevin Tunnell got drunk, got behind of the wheel of a car, and struck and killed an 18-year-old girl. Now, I first read of this story uh, in one of Max Lucado's books, but, but you can find it readily on the internet. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, HBO made a, a short movie, a 31-minute movie about uh, Kevin Tunnell's situation and his life. The, the family of the girl forgave all but $936 of the $1.5 million settlement. Now think about that. Now, they, 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 were, they settled for $1.5 million. They only received $936 because they, they forgave all the rest. For 18 years, Kevin Tunnell was required to send $1 every week to the family of the victim of the accident. $1 a week as a reminder of the tragedy for which he was responsible. That $936 at $1 a week stretches out to 18 years. And so four times, four times during the 18 years, Kevin Tunnell was taken to court for failure to send the dollar to the family. The problem, Tunnell insisted, was not a matter of defying the order, but rather that he was haunted by Maggie Glendon's death and tormented by the weekly reminders. Here's the beautiful thing. There is redemption in this story for Kevin Tunnell as later he served as a United States Marine and then has served in public office in the state of Arizona. But the torment, the agony of knowing what he did has caused so much heartache for him and for his family. Sin brings heartache. Sin brings pain. It always comes back on us. We need to be reminded of that. It always comes back on us. And so we see in the scripture that the wounds of Jesus were made by our transgressions. Sin causes sorrow, grief, sadness to pour out on our lives. The wounds made by transgressions. Again, I, I think of families who have suffered through the, the wayward ways of their children, brokenhearted and deeply wounded. I, I know folks who have failed their families in unimaginable ways and others whose children have disappointed them and, and caused pain time and time again. I, I'm embarrassed and sad to admit that, that I've caused pain at times to those I love. It's quite likely that, that all of us have family members that have brought untold pain to our families. And, and most of us, like me, are among the ones that have, been, have brought pain. Again, there, there are some stories of reconciliation and of restoration, and we, we praise God for that. I, I can think of a number of stories where uh, it, it just seemed hopeless, but God intervened and God used people to minister to those who had caused so much havoc. And, uh, and there, was, there was restoration and reconciliation. But others are still reeling because of what those dear to them have done. And so here's, here's one of the points that I really want you to remember today. There's no such thing as solitary sin. There, there are no such things as solitary sins. We hurt others by our selfishness and by our waywardness when we turn to our own ways. As Isaiah describes sin, we are pursuing our own interests, 
forming our own plans, gratifying our own pleasures, not thinking of the well-being of others. This makes us dissocial, unsocial, and the sorrows of the world are directly traceable to sin and selfishness, greed, ambition, discontent, lust, and desire. Sin never, sins never affect us alone. We live in a fallen world. And, and, and so suffering is caused by transgressions, by sin, by wickedness, by, by selfishness. We see also the willingness of Jesus to be wounded. Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions. This is a remarkable prophecy that details the suffering of Jesus in his passion. You see, it's, it's really quite clear uh, that, that the inspiration for Isaiah's prophecy comes from God. He seems to have, have written this prophecy about Jesus as though he had witnessed the crucifixion personally. Take, take time with me to think about some of the words that Isaiah uses to review these things as Isaiah described them and, and open them up to us. The word wounded means to perforate or pierce. It's not talking about a surface wound. It's talking about actually being stabbed, to being pierced. This, uh, this literally applied to the painful affliction of wounds upon the body of Christ in his hands, in his feet, in his head, and his side. He was pierced for our sins, for our transgression. But, but it also might apply to things such as Peter's denial and Judas's kiss. He was pierced for our transgressions. Peter's denial and Judas's kiss were just as effective in their wounding as was the, the crown of thorns, the beating, the nails, and the sword. He was wounded, he was pierced. We see secondly that that he was bruised, which means to be broken to, to pieces, to be crushed. The Lord Jesus was crushed by the tragedy of my sin and your sin, the tragedy of our sin, and overwhelmed by mental and physical sufferings. He was wounded, he was bruised. The word stripes means welts or bruises and is sometimes translated to mean blueness or bruised. Our term is, is black and blue, right? Black and blue. Although our black and blue could never describe what Jesus went through. And this, this is a result. These stripes are the result of a beating or a thrashing, leaving stripes with blood collected under the skin. 39 times that whip was brought across Jesus's back. The lashing of his back, which happened in Pilate's judgment hall. All this he suffered as our representative. He suffered it in our place. And, and so we, we dare not miss the point that it was not because of any sin of which he was guilty that he suffered, but it was because of the sins of others, because of our sins that he suffered. We see also the suffering compensating for sin, the suffering which covered our sin. And Isaiah speaks of the, the punishment or the chastisement that brought us peace. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was wounded or pierced for our transgressions, 
for our sinfulness, the vicarious nature of the suffering of Jesus is identified here. This New Testament, New Testament doctrine surely could not be stated more clearly than it was by Isaiah. And so listen to three quick scriptures from 1 Corinthians, Romans, and 1 Peter, which speak of this. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Romans 4.25, Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Because of what we did, Jesus suffered and died. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself, Jesus, who himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. What an amazing thought that Christ paid the price for us. He paid the price for all of our sins. The Messiah suffered for our sins. The basis and purpose of the Messiah's suffering is given in these verses. It was for our sins. That includes my sin. He was, he was my substitute and your substitute. His sufferings on the cross were for me. They were for you. You see, if, if I suffer vicariously, if I suffer on behalf of someone else, my, my pain and my misery aren't redemptive as were those of Christ. And so my vicarious suffering cannot be compared to the vicarious suffering of Christ. He died for our sins. He died so that we might know God in right relationship. I'm so thankful today that Christ's suffering had redemptive purposes. As we look at the scripture and other verses in Isaiah 53, we see the transference of our iniquity, the transference of our sin. The phrase laid on him means to impinge upon or to strike. The analogy is of rushing upon an enemy so as to overwhelm the enemy. It represents a, a meeting or a concurrence, a clash, a conflict. I, maybe the best really nonviolent, although in some ways it is violent, uh, analogy that we can use is, is when, when, when somebody in football is tackled and that, that coming together, those two people coming together and, and the, the runner being stood up and, uh, and knocked down by, by the other. As we look at this, Christ took on us, took on himself, our sin, our iniquity. Our sins were heaped on him, overwhelmed him and bent him low. He was struck down by the burden of our sins. You see, as we look at this, Jesus was the suffering lamb taken in substitution to die for those whom he represented. The Lord made a sacrifice for all. <laughs> this is beautiful. It's universal. He made a sacrifice for all. And so once again, we affirm the inclusivity of the sacrifice of the Lord. It is for all people. We see the punishment due to sin. The pe penalty by which our peace came about was laid upon Jesus. He took what we should have had to endure. And therefore, Ephesians 2.14 and Romans 5.1 tell us that Jesus is our peace. He indeed is our peace. His sufferings had a moral influence over us. Jesus didn't suffer and die because 
he needed to change. He suffered and died because I needed to change. I needed to be transformed. I needed correction in my life. Chastisement, however, was only one phase of his suffering. You see, Jesus on the cross, Jesus' punishment covered the penalty and satisfied God's judgment, God's sentence. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 tells us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We earned the wages of death, eternal damnation. Jesus stepped in and gives us the gift of eternal life by his death on the cross. He compensated for our transgressions. He compensated for our sin. He covered his, our sin with his death on the cross. He carried our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, our guilt, and he took on his body, in his body, the hostility and the animosity of the law which should have fallen on us. We were guilty, and Jesus took the hostility on himself. He suffered as if he were guilty of sin, but he wasn't. He wasn't at all guilty of sin. Consider also, and this is the final main point, the sufferings curing sin. These sufferings satisfied justice for guilt. In the sufferings of Jesus, eternal justice was met and satisfied. It's a wonderful thing for justice to be satisfied. There, there have been Many instances in our country where people have been wrongfully uh, sentenced to prison. And years later, through um, modern DNA testing and by, or by new uh, witnesses coming forward, uh, there's been, uh, there's been a, a, a turning of the sentence, right? So that they were once again freed. And, and we look at those situations and we think justice was met. Well, in, in this case, justice was met and satisfied for all of eternity. God was satisfied. The demands of the broken laws of God were met. Forgiveness could now result while God remained just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. Romans 3.25. So, so we, because of Jesus' suffering, are the recipients of God's justice because God looks upon us when we are forgiven of our sins as those who truly have not sinned. The, the assurance of justification, the, the assurance of right relationship with God, the assurance of our sins being forgiven is thus given to us as believing sinners whose sins have been judged in Christ and whose position is now identified with Christ. This one's with me. That's what Jesus says to God the Father about you and me. This one's with me. I paid the price for his or her sin. They are no longer guilty because they've humbled themselves before you, Father God, and sought your forgiveness and your forgiveness is extended to them graciously, freely, because the penalty has been paid. You see, they produced peace by reconciliation. Christ's suffering produced peace by reconciliation. He is our peace, who, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Ephesians 2.14 tells us. Peace follows justification and reconciliation with God. To be justified is to be made just as if I had never sinned. And so when we come to God and we say, please forgive me, I'm a sinner, I need you. He wipes the slate clean. It's just as if we'd never sinned. 
And in that moment, we are regener regenerated. We are made new creatures in Christ and we are adopted into the family of God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And so as we look at this, peace follows justification and reconciliation with God. There is no continued hostility between God and humanity. God is appeased, God is reconciled, God is ready to forgive. The knowledge of this reconciliation through the sufferings of Jesus is the central experience of the Christian faith. Think about this. The knowledge of this reconciliation through the sufferings of Jesus is the central experience of the Christian faith. We can know that we are forgiven. We can know that we're right with God. We don't have to do guesswork here. We can with assurance know that we are in good standing with God. We see that these sufferings affected healing. Isaiah says, by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Have you experienced the healing of God in your life? His suffering, Jesus' suffering, brings spiritual healing in our lives. It produces soundness of soul. In quoting this thought from Isaiah, Peter makes it refer to pardon and forgiveness, 1 Peter 2.24. And as a result, the believer is in the care of of the shepherd of his soul or her soul. The recovery can be complete. We can be made whole in Christ again. We can be restored in the image of God. By the grace of God, we can be Christ-like. There will be soundness and spiritual wholeness, spiritual health through Jesus. And so we pray the benediction from Revelations 1, 5, and 6. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we, as we have looked at God's word today, We've seen that sin causes suffering. We've seen that Jesus died to cover our sin. We've seen that Jesus' suffering is a cure for our sin. And so here are the takeaways for this day. Sin causes suffering. Sin always causes suffering and pain. And we are affected by our own sin as well as by the sin of others. Our sin is hurtful and damaging to other people. But Jesus willingly and especially felt the weight of our sin when he died on the cross. He wasn't guilty of sin, but he suffered as though he was for us. Sin causes suffering. My sin causes suffering. Your sin causes suffering. Jesus suffered. Secondly, Jesus suffered to compensate for or to cover our sin. And in doing so, Jesus makes it possible for us to have peace with God, to be reconciled to God, to be in right relationship with God. Jesus took on himself the punishment which we should have received. It's as though your brother stepped in when you were a kid and took the spanking, the whipping that you should have received, a whipping that was well-deserved for you, but not for the brother that stepped in. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Our older brother stepped in and he took the pain and the suffering, the whipping. He took our death on himself, our sin on himself, that we might be able to become right in God's sight. Jesus's sufferings, thirdly, third takeaway, Jesus's sufferings 
are the cure for our sin. The sufferings cure sin. God is satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus, which makes it possible for us to be healed in our spirits. The image of God is restored and renewed in us as we ask for forgiveness and walk daily in obedience to God and his word, the Bible. And so I beg you today, consider the suffering of Jesus, which was for you and for me. Embrace the truth, the beautiful truth, that Jesus' suffering on the cross can cover your sin. Embrace the beautiful truth that if you will believe that Jesus died for you and confess that he rose from the dead, that you can be saved. If you will say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And herein is the cure for your sin and my sin. The death and resurrection of Jesus bring us life. His death is life-giving. And if we will give ourselves over to him and live for him obediently, right relationship with, with God is indeed possible. It can be reality. Will you receive his suffering, his cross today, his death, his resurrection, that you might know the life which he wants to bring to you? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word and the truth of your word today that Jesus suffered for us that we might know you. We can't gloss over it. We can't ignore it. We must, Lord, accept the fact that, that there was atrocity committed against God, God the Son, so that we might live in right relationship with you. So receive us as we receive you. Receive us as we call upon you for forgiveness. Receive us, Lord God, as we embrace the beauty of life with you, because Jesus died for us. We can be forgiven. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance, his face towards you and give you his shalom, his wholeness of life as you, as you surrender yourself and give yourself to him. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't let the day go by without knowing in your heart that because you've sought God's forgiveness, you are a child of God. May you be blessed today. Goodbye now. Lead me to the cross.